Chapter 18. Unnatural Causes. The job had strange written all over it. Hope. Finally, I had found another mayor whom I respected and admired, and who respected, and maybe even admired, me in return. One who was attracted to mares, and who I could believe was at least a little physically attracted to me. We weren't in love, we barely knew each other, but there was the possibility of love. There was, in a word, hope. The last sixteen hours had made a very long day. As much as I would have loved to spend the next several hours with homage, she had realized straight away that I was in no shape for anything but sleep. So she had sent me back to my suite, where Velvet Remedy had puttered and tusked about my wounds until I had fallen into a dreamless sleep out of sheer exhaustion. I woke up very late in the morning, hungry, and for more than just food. Velvet Remedy was already awoken and disappeared into the shops to get the best caps for everything. Calamity had decided to swipe from the ruins of the Red Racer factory in the Ministry Morale Hub. Most of what Velvet and I had scavenged was intended for our own use. Food, ammo, mostly, as well as the poison glands I cut off of the manacores. After what she had been through, I decided to allow the Sea Blue Pony to keep my poison dart gun. I had everything needed to create another one once I returned home. Clemity had seen to the purchase of a workstation, currently very disassembled, which he would install at Junction R7 when we arrived. Which, thanks to the parts needed to repair the Sky Bandit, shouldn't be more than a few days. I wasn't about to leave until I had a chance to spend quality time with homage. Out of more than curiosity, I turned my pit butt to DJ Poem 3 station and listened to the music playing while I cleaned and groomed myself. Homage was already beginning to integrate the new music into DJ Poem 3's playlists. That unusual upbeat song about mending friendships which Homage and I had danced to was playing as I cleaned my teeth and tried to work all the tangles out of my mane and tail. Hoorah! DJ Poem 3's voice thundered over the airwaves as the song ended. Celeste and Luna bless us. We have new music. And with that new music comes new news. Ready for this? Last night, our wasteland survivor. My telekinesis imploded, dropping everything I was floating. That kid from the stable found and rescued the good folks of Gutterville. And what horror did she save them from, you ask? A psychotic ghoul scientist who was performing experiments with taint and who had bred himself a small army of manticores. That, folks, is what they mean by crushing two rad roaches with one hoof. Not only, she not only saved the lives of the ponies, but she also solved Manhattan's manticore problem, too. I dropped my head into the sink, letting out a whimpering sigh. My reputation was totally out of control. I barely heard the door to the suite open as I anguished over what the ponies would be thinking and expecting of me now. Part of me swore homage just liked making me squirm. Hell, you see the kid, tell her to stop by and visit old DJ Pwn3. Wants to give her a big kiss for that one. My head shot up, catching my horn painfully on the faucet. Ow! You do know there's more civilized ways to get a drink of water than slurping it out of the sink, right? Velvet Remedy's voice rang out from the other room. Wincing, I touched my horn, looking at myself in the mirror, then turned to Velvet. She was pulling a small red wagon behind her, loaded with supplies and dresses. I stared at the rather fancy and elegant gowns. I thought we would want to look our best for DJ Pwn3, she stated simply. Crap. I'd forgotten about Velvet Remedy's impending addition. Don't worry, I know your size. I've wrapped you in bandages often enough to know that. I felt myself blushing. Velvet Remedy floated a pair of dresses 
both simple yet graceful, towards me. They'll look perfect on you. Trust me. The one on the right would really bring out your eyes. The one on your left will beautifully complement your mane and tail. Which one should I wear, then? It's up to you. Or, if you want to be the mysterious, both. Find an excuse to step out and charge halfway through the evening. Velvet Remedy smiled brightly. Go on. Take them. A girl can never have too many dresses. I nodded, floating them to my bed with care. Then jumped and gave Velvet Remedy a hug. Thank you. Oh, think nothing of it, dear. She whined kindly. Velvet Remedy was expecting to meet DJ Pone 3. I needed to talk with Homage and find out how she would handle this. If Homage was willing to reveal herself to me, trusting me with such a big secret, then it stood to reason she would be equally willing in regards to my friends. Part of me, however, didn't want her to. I wanted it to remain our little secret, just Homage and I. Something special between us. I wanted her not to want to trust any other pony. Not even Velvet Remedy was such a gift. It was a selfish thought. I knew I should be ashamed of myself for having, having it. But I consoled myself that this was Homage's secret to tell or keep. So the fact that I was keeping it from my friends was an act of virtue. On the way to the elevator, I passed a poster. Pinkie Pie, it insisted, was watching me. Forever. On the opposite wall was a poster of Fluttershy. This time, not modeling for Sparkle Cola, but an actual poster for her own ministry. War, fear, death. We must do better. Ministry of Peace. We must do better. We should do better. I should be better. I understood why Velvet Remedy loved that yellow Pegasus pony. If only there had been more like her, then the equestrian wasteland may never have been. I still contemplated that poster when Homage stepped out of the elevator, her face brightening as she spotted me. Ah! Just the toaster repair pony I was looking for! I would never live that down. Homage, I breathed, feeling my heart flutter a bit as I fully drank in the fact that this pretty gray unicorn with the vibrant blue mane actually had feelings for me. Possibly romantic feelings. Or at least, she was willing to entertain the idea of them. That alone was more than I'd ever had from a mare before. And from a mare whom I really liked. And who was cute, too. Yes, she said playfully, making me stummer. I, uh, I, that is we, uh, when and how did you want to do the thing at the place? The thing at the place? I waved a hoof in frustrated expression. Y you know, Velvet Remedy, DJ Pone 3, recording her music? Oh, Homage grinned, that thing at that place. You trust her, right? The pony of the Ten Penny Tower, no, me as DJ Pone 3's errand girl. But I really can't let it get out that I'm a bit closer to him than that. She can keep a secret? Part of me hated sharing the truth about homage, but it would be wrong not to. Forever. You are DJ Pone 3? Homage smiled, clearly enjoying Velvet Remedy's disbelief. Velvet Remedy had made herself up gorgeously and donned one of her new dresses, a stunning purple number with all the intention of making a breathtaking first impression. Now, she was shooting me cross glances. I've got a whole recording studio in here, so the recording will be as good as you are, Homage said, stepping between us So, as she spoke to Velvet Remedy. I found myself staring at Homage's flanks, covered with a silky silver dress that sparkled as it clung so tightly. Velvet was looking at me. She'd caught me staring, and a little smile on her face made my heart sink. I'd be lucky if the rest of our travels weren't a soundtrack of Little Pip and Homage sitting in an apple tree. Homage gave 
Velvet Remedy, a much abbreviated tour, skipping the roof and the Athenium altogether, but showing off the recording studio and the that exited off the M-A-S-E-B-S. -E Velvet looked like she was in heaven. No matter how much she protested, no matter how much she longed to be a medical pony, the only one Velvet could hope to convince that she didn't get unparalleled joy from singing was Velvet herself. As Velvet Remedy entered the studio chamber, Homage turned her attention to the recording equipment, waving her horn over a desk of dials and switches. Rows of colorful lights lit up at once. I was left to sit in a corner and watch the show. Velvet Remedy approached the microphone. Sound check. Do you hear me clearly, clearly DJ? Yeah. What should I call you? Homage, when we're together. I felt a completely irrational twang of jealousy at the mention of them together. I clapped my forehead. Such feelings were as unbecoming as they were ridiculous. Stop being a silly pony, little Pip, I heard myself whisper under my breath. This is an amazing setup, homage, Velvet admired. Then, almost too casually, she asked, Do you happen to have a workbench anywhere around here? Homage looked up from the recording project table desk. Yes. Why? Oh, good. Little Prep has a project, and she needs a private workspace, Father Remedy claimed. Now, I felt really stupid for having felt that involuntary twang. Even on the verge of giving a performance that would be heard equestria-wide, Velvet Remedy was thinking about helping me. I suspect the project will take her all night, she purred conspiratorially. Is it alright if she spends the night with you, isn't it? Solar Flaring Orgasms of Celestia Oh, I'd love the chance to, heard homage back, entertain her for a night. I was doomed. Ready when you are. Mother Remedy's horn began to glow. The recording chamber filled with a light and rich electric music. Homage was struck with awe. I smiled, knowing the impact of a Velvet Remedy performance. Music is my remedy. Four hours later, Homage and I strolled the mall of Ten Pony Tower. Velvet Remedy had been amazing. At her insistence, Homage had let Velvet perform each song multiple times, making sure that she had the best performance possible for each. Once her performance was complete, my charcoal-coated companion had been exhausted and had taken her leave of us to take a nap. Homage had been gushing about the performance and the new music sense. Thankfully, I felt no repeated pangs of jealousy at this. I was, in fact, rather in awe myself. Homage and I spent over an hour just reliving the performance like a couple of fan fillies after a concert. The first song had long been a stable two favorite of mine. If I was to attribute to her a theme song, it would have been this one and the second, also a popular one from her day in the stables. The third was her rendition of a song that she had once told me was originally performed by Pinkie Pie and the original DJ Pwn3 at Hoofbeats, something she had chosen especially for DJ Pwn3. It was the song she had started to sing at Shattered Hoof, and I was thrilled to finally hear it in completion. The effect on homage was thrilling. I loved seeing the little gray unicorn squeal. The final number was one that I heard Velvet Remedy constructing during our travels. The one she com uh, once claimed was about me, but I couldn't decide if I wanted to melt or to hide. We had reached the edge of our of a floor staring down to the lower level of Ten Pony Tower Mall, filled with classy shops, including one just for wine and another across from it which had been just for cheese, but was now closed. As we approached the stairs down, I stopped at the site below. Steelhooves was trotting around, peering into storefront windows, taking in displays of art, casually as you please. All around him, ponies were stopping and staring, 
So I'm shying away. I saw a mother pull her filly cautiously behind her, protectively. Your friend is causing us quite a stir, Hamish noted. I chuckled. I guess the high society of Ten Pony isn't used to seeing a pony in magical power armor. I wondered if his armored hooves were scuffing their pretentiously polished marble floor. Well, he is a steel ranger. That gives most ponies pause. This was not the first time I heard some pony I trusted suggest that steel rangers had a less than sterling reputation. Why is that? Hamid looked at me with surprise. You're traveling with a steel ranger, she said slowly, and you don't know anything about them? I opened my muzzle to say that I knew they were... what? I knew them to be from the posters, but those were 200 years old. The truth was, I didn't know the steel rangers. I knew steel hooves. At least, more than my companions knew the enigmatic pony completely concealed by his armor. I had seen a memory orb. One of a memory that I assumed, with reason, was his. No, I suppose I really don't. Tell me. How much guided us away from the stairs and towards a table with a small but expensive eatery? A waitress prony brought us menus the moment we sat down, managing to look haughtily as if her customers were beneath her. Looking at the menu, I once again discovered that everything on it was a fancified version of pre-war food. I shook my head, pushing the menu aside. Fifty bottle caps for a banana puree that I can find in the refrigerator of a ruined building for free? No thanks. Frying it up into strips and weaving it into to look like a basket isn't worth that much. How much lifted an eyebrow? Try to remember that most ponies here wouldn't last a day on the outside. There are raiders, slavers, renegades, security robots, and possibly even a stray manticore between them and that free food. She looked around at the other patrons. They leaned forward and whispered. Honestly, I don't think most of these ponies could handle rat roaches. They'd stomp one, then the other rat roaches would kill them while they were still trying to scrape the rat roach gunk from their hooves in uncontrolled disgust. I looked around the elite mares and gentle stallions of Ten Pony. She was probably right. The stockpiles from Ten Pony Tower itself ran out generations ago. What they sell now has been acquired from scavenger ponies, specialists in pumping the ruins of Manhattan for foodstuffs. Fortunately, there were food shops, restaurants, and groceries galore in the city before the bomb, so scavenging has been as fruitful as it was dangerous. But scavenger ponies don't risk their necks for cheap, and with how irradiated all the water is, it's hard for a pony family to purify enough, even for a tiny garden. For a restaurant like this, fresh crops are out of the question. I considered that and picked up the menu again. I ordered a fried banana puree basket and a bottle of wine. It was surprisingly full of flavor. The Steel Rangers, Homage explained, over our glasses of wine, are the old guard of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. They see themselves as the knights of the greatest greatness of the past, which they consider to be tied to Equestria's advancements in technology and industry and custodians of the technology that their ministry helped create. Honestly, most of them would be more interested in saving your pit buck than saving you. After lunch, I treated homage to an early evening at the spa. The last time had been so utterly delightful that I had to share the experience with her. Homage had asked that the small radio in the spa be turned to DJ Pwn3 station. From the expression the spa ponies gave her, they didn't much approve of the ghoul-loving renegade, but they were used to this request. With the new music playing, I suspected that the broadcast's popularity was peaking. One of the petty spa ponies was dabbing my face with cleansing and revitalizing mud when the voice of DJ Pwn3 blasted out of the radio. And good evening, children! I looked to homage in surprise. She winked back before they covered her eyes with a slice of cucumber. 
Got a question for all you faithful listeners. Have any of you mares or bucks ever seen a ghost? Now, DJ Poem 3, I hear you say, there's no such thing as ghosts. But ghost stories about Manhattan ever since my grandmother's grandmother was a filly. And no pony's actually seen one. Ghost stories are all made up, you know? Well, now, what if I, DJ Poem 3, your voice in the wasteland, were to tell you that I have seen a ghost. And I don't mean heroic stable dwellers who miraculously survived falling off cliffs and trains. Not this time. I groaned aloud. I would have clenched my eyes, but they were already covered with vegetables. Now, it was several years ago, and I had just gotten myself out of a tight spot with one of those manticores. So I was riding Dash and Stampede at that time. But she was there. Celestia's honest truth. Never seen her again, or found the exact spot I'd stumble onto. But there are more crazy things in this wild wasteland than you'd ever believe. Later, as Spa Ponies gave us a pony petty and a horn treatment, I asked homage. What is Stampede? Oh, a mixture of rage and painkillers, Homage answered. A friend and I found the recipe in the ruins of an MOP clinic when we were younger. My curiosity took hold. A friend? Will I get to meet her? No. I'm afraid my friend didn't survive the efforts to get us to Ten Pony Tower. I felt amazingly refreshed and relaxed. Our time in the spa had been pleasant and intimate, and I had high hopes for the rest of the evening. As we stepped out of the spa, how much leaned close and whispered, had that last bit pre-recorded. It's a good idea to be seen in public occasionally, while DJ Pwn3 is live in the studio. I nodded, staring at her a little. The mud bath had been the first time I had seen her wearing nothing but a dress nor a bat robe. Her cutie mark looked like it could have been either a speaker or a megaphone. Either way, it was perfectly appropriate for her. I could see why she chose to keep it privately, private through dressing finally, though. If anyone suspected that she was more than just DJ Poem 3's errand filly, the cutie mark would be all but a dead giveaway. Three ponies galloped up to us, two colts and a younger filly. The two youngest had tears in their eyes, the colt trying to hold his, hold his back while the filly was blinking her tears away with a hopeful expression. I heard Homage moan at their approach. Miss Homage? The oldest called out as they drew close. DJ Pwn3 says that Daddy tried to rob the heroine of the Wastelands and that he's in jail. Is it true? Did he really do that? Daddy wouldn't. Oh, fuck me on the moon. Moon, sun, both of them raped me hard. Homage looked, if anything, even less comfortable. But she stood by the truth. Yes, children. I'm afraid he did. But he's really sorry, I interjected, even though I knew the only thing Monteria Jack was actually sorry about was that it put him in a bad place. And I'm sure they'll let him go. I, I paused, wincing as I chose my words, speaking more slowly. I know the stable dweller is really upset to see him in jail. Will she save him? The filly blurted out, with so much hope in her voice, it nearly knocked me over. Why would he why would she do that? her eldest brother retorted. He threatened her and tried to rob her. I looked to Homage hopelessly. They ain't gonna let him go, said the middle brother. They're gonna hang him in two days. I paced back and forth in the <clears throat> Athenium as Homage watched me sadly. You can't interfere. Oh yes, I can. Homage gave a melancholy sigh. I understand why you feel you should, even if he did lay his own hay. But from what you said, it doesn't sound like he wants to be helped. I snorted. Well, then I'm not going to leave it up to him. He has three children that need looking after. 
They need to come before his twisted-up coat of honor. Little Pip, Homage whispered. We've just met. I don't want to lose you already. I stopped, shocked. Lose me? In exasperation, Homage pointed out. If you do anything and survive the guards with their battle saddles, you and your friends will never be allowed to set Hoof and Ten Pony Tower again. I turned and looked into her eyes. They were glistening, ready to cry. I'll be with you, always, pretty much wherever you go. Just tune in to DJ Pwn3, and I'll be there. But you won't be able to be back with me. I fell back on my haunches, as the weight of what I would be sacrificing depended fully upon me. Night was falling as I slowly walked along the Celestial Line. Velvet Emony Steel Hooves walked along behind me, and Calamity was flying Scout. All I had told the others was that I was going for a walk. Every one of them insisted on coming with me. Only Velvet Remedy asked if there was a reason why, and she did so in private. She could tell I was distressed, and she was alarmed that I was not spending the evening with homage. Calamity, I think, was looking for an excuse to stretch his wings, and Steel Hooves simply fell behind me without comment. I felt he would go anywhere I did, and I still had no idea why. The truth was, as much as I wanted to spend all night with homage, I was too messed up inside to enjoy it. I needed fresh air. I needed to clear my head. I needed a distraction. Fortunately, the Grey Unicorn had not only understood, but had encouraged me. Velvet Remedy's horn provided light. I didn't even need the one from my peck buck. The quiet of the night wrapped around us like a blanket, punctured by the occasional distant screams or gunshots. Each time, Calamity swooped away to investigate. Sometimes, he came back with reports of scavengers fighting up wild animals. Most of the time, he returned no wiser than before. Once his disappearance was followed by several little thundercracks, I knew the sound of his battle saddle by heart. I heard no return fire. But we all stopped and waited, and worried all the same. It took him a quarter of an hour to return, and when he did so, he was laden with sacks of pillified goods. Raider nest. Bunch of earth pony raiders with spears and sledgehammers, he explained with a grin. No pony expects a pegasus. He landed and passed me a sack full of metal apples. They didn't have any ammo either, they just had these. Steel Hooves op offered to take the grenades. Of the lot of us, he was the only one who actually had any skill with the things. One of these days, we gotta get you something that don't do splash damage. Calamity passed another sack, this one clearly holding a square box with beveling edges inside of it. To Velvet Remedy. The medical kit they had was locked, so I just brung the whole thing. Brought. Velvet Remedy corrected as she took the sack. That's what I said. Velvet rolled her eyes to me before slinging the sack over her, clasping it to her saddlebag harness. There was no rush in opening it. I could pick the lock when we reached the Four Stars station. Presents delivered, Clemity flew ahead again. The next Four Star station was the site of a massacre. I watched steel hooves tread between the bodies of over 30 ghouls. Most of them looked like they'd been mowed down by heavy minigun fire. Powerful explosions had torn holes in the walls of the station and the homes that had been built into and around it. The place was rank with the wet smell of ghoul corpses. The buzzing of flies were a constant drone that reminded me of the high whine of Stable 2's lights. Old Remedy had fled up the line about 300 yards, unable to stomach it. Calamity was looting the bodies. Rotten Tails group, Steel Hoops finally announced, long after I had come to that same realization. He kept his deep voice neutral. I wished I could see his expression behind the mask. 
Steel hooves. I asked cautiously. Are you all right? Why wouldn't I be? He asked. Again, keeping his voice neutral. Too neutral. He was refraining from something. Whether it was laughing in joy or raging in offense. I couldn't guess. How about you? You're not indulging in the looting, I notice. As Calamity would say, it's not like these creatures are going to use them anymore. Might as well go to our own use. To steal hooves, looting ghouls was okay, but looting steel rangers was not. I didn't like that, although the consideration I had to admit to myself that I'd probably react considerably worse towards the looting of bodies of stable dwellers. I'm going to burn them, I announced, as soon as Calamity is done scavenging. If you want, you should join him in that. Interesting, Steel Hooves intoned, but remained with me. I found his reaction to my... My reaction as interesting as he appeared, apparently found my reaction to be. As morbid and repulsive as the setting was, I decided to attempt a fathom to fathom our new friend. I heard about the Steel Rangers. They don't exactly have a heroic reputation. Is that how you see yourself? He replied. You're a hero? I flinched, but quickly suspected that he was deflecting. How about you? How do you see yourself? As a traditionalist. Okay. What the hell did that mean? I tried again. I'm told the most Steel Rangers are more interested in saving technology than saving ponies. How about you? Steel Hoos was quiet. I pressed. Are you following us around to keep my pit buck safe? Steel Hoos snorted a laugh. Then somberly, I revealed a little... He revealed a little himself. Steel Rangers... Each and every one swear the same oath. But there is some divergence of opinion as to whether our fealty is owed to the mayor of the ministry or to the ministry itself. He spoke of the ministry as if there was only one, or at least only one of importance. Are they that different? I asked. But Clamber returned before I could get an answer, and Steel Hooves was not willing to share with an audience. I think I've got everything we might want. You have a strong back for a Pegasus, Steel Hooves ribbed. Are you sure you don't want to get the furniture as well? Clamity grunted, flapping his wings. Ignoring the guy of Steel Hooves' comment, I considered the underlying truth. Clamity. Why don't you fly back and unload the stuff back at the suite? You can catch up with us. We'll be on the Celestia line. Calamity smiled, tipping his hat. Will do. Then he was off. I focused. The bodies of the ghouls wrapped in light one by one. I levitated them into a pile, then walked out ahead of one of the monorails, with steel hooves following the other. I reached a safe distance and a turn, floating up the zebra rifle, I spent half a clip on the mound of ghoul cavadiers. The pile began to burn. We reached Velvet Remedy, who was staring at the ghoulish pyre with strange fascination. I looked back, trying to figure out why the sight held her gaze so. A balefire phoenix was circling the bonfire of corpses. Repeating message. Again, this is Blackwing of Blackwing's Talons, sending out a distress call on every friendly frequency. Please, send this message to any talent companies in the area. My team and I are trapped on the roof of Horseshoe Tower by enemy forces. We are low on ammo and cannot hold out much longer. Oh. Oh no. Here come more of them. The radio message ended abruptly, then looped, repeating the words of the female griffin. She sounded younger than God, and not as hard. My pit buck had started receiving the distress signal over a mile away from Horseshoe Tower. 
The signal was weak, but Horseshoe Tower had been one of the tallest buildings in all of Equestria, and was the largest skyscraper remaining in the Manhattan ruins, easily dwarfing Tempony Tower by over double its height. To anyone receiving this message, this is Blackwing of Blackwing's Talons. Please, we need help. We're pinned to the roof of the Horseshoe Tower by overwhelming enemy forces. We are low on ammo and food, and we've lost three of our team already. We are in desperate need of assistance. If anyone can hear this message, please bring help. Please hurry. We can't hold out much longer. This is a repeating message. Again, this is Blackwing. I removed my earlobe and played the recording aloud as we got within a few blocks. I'd hoped Calamity would catch up with us before we had reached the skyscraper's four-star station, but I wasn't willing to wait. Each loop of the message pressed upon me the mounting sense of urgency. We're going in, I announced, and reconsidered my words. I'm going in. You two can stay behind if you want. I understand. I swished my tail. Besides, some point you should let Calamity know where we are. Steel Hooves nickered. Personally, I look forward to the chance of meeting these noble ghoul slayers. He looked at me. And you are going because? Are you being a heroine? You enjoy risking your life for strangers? Or is there something else about Horseshoe Tower? I glared at my companion, then smirked. Oh, I just want to know how a bunch of griffins could get trapped on the roof of a building. Steelhoofs chuckled. I turned to Velvet Remedy. You are not going in alone. Velvet insisted with a grim smile and stomp. And we can leave Calamity a note. She paused. He can read, can't he? I rolled my eyes. Yes, and you know it. Then considered the idea and found myself at a loss. I saw the clipboard and pencil that I had taken from Ten Pony Tower, Constabulary. But a note left under a chunk of uh, crumbling concrete could easily be missed. For Calamity to see it, we would need to paint the message in big letters on the roof of a station. And even then, he would miss it if we didn't illuminate it somehow. I pointed these problems out to Velvet Remedy. In case you missed the light we showed earlier, dear, illumination will not be a problem. Velvet smiled wearily. I can cast a spell on the letters that'll make them quite eye-catching. Can you just make glowing words? Velvet Remedy shook her head. Yes, but only if I stay here to maintain them. To leave them behind, I would have to enchant existing writing. Paint, preferably. Unless we find a really big ink pot. Still he was whined as he trotted past us to the station's double doors that led into Horseshoe Tower. And we'll paint it on the f in the first in the blood of the first enemy we encounter. He turned and bucked the doors hard enough to not only swing them open, but send one of them flying across the room inside. I cringed and thanked the goddess that the room wasn't full of enemies. Are you coming? I helped Velvet step over the body of the griffin. His bulk nearly doubled by the twin minigun battle saddle that he was strapping on his corpse. It was the first body that we had found, which wasn't, wasn't centuries old. The floor was littered with bullet casings, making walking around it treacherous. I couldn't tell what killed him. That worried me. It worried me even more than Velvet Remedy diagnosing it as natural causes. Her voice loaded with disbelief. At least we know they came this way, still who's observed. I was beginning to worry there was no way up. Much of Horseshoe's tower and interior had collapsed. Stairwells had crumbled. Hallways had caved in. The entire building had become a maze, forcing us to weave in and out of rooms in order to make it to the end of a hallway to the other, making us go down a floor to find stairs that would take us up too. Ahead, we could hear the spray of water. 
My pit bug started click clicking softly. The only way to get up the next flight of stairs had been through a collapsed section of wall between two bathrooms. The building's water talisman was still pumping water through the shattered pipes. The water was alive with low levels of radi radiation. The balefire bomb had probably irradiated the talisman itself. I checked with Velvet Remedy, making sure we had enough rat away with us. The radioactive shower should be minor, nothing worth getting concerned about. But if this was a sign of bigger problems ahead, I wanted to be sure we were prepared. Holding my breath, I pushed myself through the spray as quickly as I could. I stumbled a little as the wet floorboards on the other side gave an inch. Okie dokie loki. Steel hooves. I'll be floating you through and letting you down over here, I said, pointing at the far corner of the room near the doorway out. This floor is not stable. Velvet Remedy stayed back. I focused on steel hooves, wrapping him in a telekinetic blanket. Slowly, I lifted the heavy ranger up, half a yard, and brought him through the shower. I took a single step back, feeling the floor wobble alarmingly once again. I guided him past me towards a corner that I was fairly certain would be dry and stable. Steel was made it halfway there, when he saw something through the open door that made him thrash trying to find purchase on the floor. Before I could put him down, before I could even ask what he saw, the alicorn stepped into the doorway. My levitation mo magic imploded as I gasped in shock. Seal hooves dropped hard, turning to fire at the alicorn, and the floor gave way beneath him. Steel hooves dropped out of sight, and I heard splashes beneath. The alicorn took a step forward, looking down at the hole and the rest of the floor collapsed. The alicorn tried to thrust out her wings to fly, but they stuck to the sides of the door frame, and she just fell to the floor beneath her. I found myself standing on a wet, sagging plank jetting out of the floor below, like a diving board. Which was appropriate, since the floor was basically a swimming pool. My pipbuck started click click clicking with great enthusiasm. Scrambling, on the floating debris, the alicorn thrashed. Her horn began to glow. Steel hooves was nowhere in sight, having surely sunk to the bottom. I wished for the bag of grenades. I had to act fast, but my mind wasn't thinking fast enough. The alicorn would have her shield up before I could figure out what to do. Kablam! An explosion rang out right next to my head and blew on my eardrums. The world became a stained high buzz. I immediately lost all sense of balance, trembling in position. I landed on a soft chunk of floorboard that immediately began to capsize. I gasped the chunk of floor teleclinically, letting out a scream that I could feel but not hear. Focusing had become excru excruciating, and in front of me I saw the alicorn floating in debris and blood. Velvet Remedy had blown a large chunk of the creature's neck away with the combat shotgun. It wasn't dead, but it was a race between blood loss and drowning as to which would finish her off first. I watched in horror as it began to heal, the wound slowly closing. They fucking regenerate? That was not fair! That was not okay! With a flash of anger, I started telekinetically grasping jagged floating bits of floor and jabbing them at the alicorn's neck, until I had crudely sawn it off. The creature began to sink beneath the reddened, radioactive water. Velvet Remedy crouched over me, her horn, horn pointing at my left ear. She had already restored hearing to my right. Steel Hoof stood next to us at the edge of the swimming pool, dripping with water that was making my pit buck clickety-click wildly. He was arguing with Velvet over how much right away he needed to drink. Velvet was leaning towards every last packet we had. Steel Hooves was insisting he didn't need any at all. My ears began to mend. We don't have time for this, Steel Hooves stomped, clacking the tiles under his armored hoof. Those creatures always travel in groups. Then take the rat away and stop being a baby, my shotgun surgeon spatted back, glaring. 
Seriously, do all my patients have to be so difficult? I wanted to point out that if that I was lying here in the very not difficult, thank you. Steel hooves bristled at that. Finally, I spoke up. Steel hooves. Tell her. Both of them turned to stare at me. Or at least, I assumed Steel hooves was staring at me. His visor was pointed in my direction. Tell me what? Velvet asked me slowly. Then, turning to Steel hooves, tell me what? Steel hooves was sm silent. I sighed. Look, if I was able to figure it out, so will she. She's smarter than I am. I could tell Velvet Remedy was forcing herself not to at react at the compliment. Steel hooves finally relented. I'm a ghoul. Velvet Remedy, to her credit, didn't take a step back. Didn't even gasp. She was just strangely quiet for a while. Long enough that I had worried that I'd lost my hearing again. If it wasn't for the drip, drip, drip on the tiles underneath the Steel Ranger. Radiation is regenerative for ghouls, Steel Hooves admitted. I was in more danger of drowning. In truth, there had been a little danger of what the rebreather with his magical power armor. Of course, I realized slowly and stupidly the Alicorn was regenerating because of the pool. Radiation must affect them the same way. Well then, I guess you won't need the right away. Velvet Remedy concluded casually, slipping the packs back into one of her open medical boxes. Knowing I was by far the most capable of stealth, I determined that I should scout ahead. I spotted the Alicorn's two sisters in a room on the next floor. Their tails were to me, oblivious to my presence, as they seemed to be focusing on trying to magically rip the door to a safe off its hinges. Their coats were a deep purple, almost black, and that was not all I noticed. They had no cutie marks. I slipped out of my sniper rifle and slid into the zen of sats. Blam! A first orlicorn went down hard, brain blasting out the front of her skull to paint the safe she had been focusing on. The second began to turn, her shield already starting to form, but I was faster, and these creatures were not that much tougher than the rest of us, if caught unaware and without the protective shields cast. BLAM! I slipped out of sats, and the second alicorn's body slumped to the floor. I looked at the safe. The splatter of blood, brains, and bone reminded me that we never did go back and paint that note for Calamity. Wait. Stop. I'm looking at the gore from some pony. Or at least something that I have murdered. And I'm thinking, that? Am I really becoming that callous to the horrors and violence of the equestrian wastelands? I wondered if this would fit a Monterey Jack's side of self loss. I also wondered what the hell the Alicorns had been after. So I trotted up to pick the lock. The safe, however, refused to be unlocked. After examination and struggling, I realized that it wasn't jammed or broken by the Alicorns. I just wasn't good enough. Well, I knew how to fix that. I found myself smiling as the party time mintals washed over me and washed me clean of the stupidity and dullness that was holding me back. I took a deep breath in relief. Finally, I was the real me again. The smile faded as I turned to see Velvet Remedy watching me sadly. Three more alicorns stood on the other side of a gaping divide. At least five internal floors had collapsed, leaving a honeycomb of half rooms ringing a massive pit. Motes of debris and ash floated in the void between us. Steel Hooves opened fire with his grenade machine gun, taking out one of them, and all the rooms around her, before she could fully erect her shield. The two others launched themselves into the air, 
spreading their wings as their shields bubbled around them. I gave prayer to Luna and floated out a memory orb, making sure it was the one of Pinkie Pie's last party, and not the one I had retrieved from the safe seven floors below. I began levitating the orb closer, towards the closer of the two. The alicorn let out a wicked, bitter, and majestic laugh that echoed off the walls of the pit. Using telekinesis of her own, she knocked it free with my telekinetic sheath. With a curl of with a hurled chair. The orb containing the memory of Pinkie Pie's last party plunged into the depths below, bounced, rolled, and disappeared through a crack, lost forever. The dark purple coated alicorn's voice rumbled with undeniable superiority. Do you think we are fools? We remember how you killed us before. Oh, we are so fucked. Run! I yelled, turning tail and racing towards the stairs. Velvet Remedy and Steel Hooves galloped after me, overtaking me as they charged up out of the stairwell and into a hallway. Turning, I ordered Steel Hooves to collapse the entrance behind us. His grenade machine gun was useless against that shielded alicorn, but more than a match for a crumbling structure we were in. Concrete and wood rained down in a thunderous cloud of dust. What happened? Steelhoof demanded. Panting, I explained. There's some sort of telepathy involved. My fears had been proven true. Match up between the ones that are together. All of them. Every time we kill one, they learn from it. I wouldn't be able to trick them the same way twice. Our ploy only bought us time. But not much. I could hear them on the other side, clearing a path to us. With a flash of light, one of the alicorns appeared right between us. They can teleport, too? Velvet Remedy blurted, finally reaching the same level of hateful disbelief I felt for these creatures. The alicorn herself seemed a little surprised. Apparently, teleporting to some place you can't see was tricky, even for these creatures. I don't think she expected to be this close. Too bad she hadn't appeared a yard on either side and stuck herself in a wall. But no, we couldn't be that lucky. Or could we? I realized something very peculiar. The alicorn's shield of sh sphere of shielding was up at full strength, but she appeared literally in the center of us. Parts of each of us were inside the barrier, including Steel Hu's metal rear end. The alicorn began casting a spell. I felt a vice tighten around my heart. My hooves began to tingle. A heart attack spell? Feeling panic well up inside me, my heart struggled to beat. I knew how these creatures had killed the griffins through natural causes. Move! I yelled as I telekinetically grabbed the sack of grenades. Sue hooves dashed forward, leaving the grenades inside the sack. Without opening it to reveal the contents, I focused and tried to pull as many of the pins as I could. Unfortunately, moving objects I couldn't directly see was as difficult for me as teleporting into an unknown space for the alicorn. I only managed to pull the pins on three before I backed out of the shield. The alicorn looked questioningly down at the sack that fell to her feet. Her shield, shield contained the explosion quite effectively. It was a gory and brilliant sight. Well, that would explain how griffins can get trapped on a roof, I said flatly. We had to fight through four more of the creatures below before we made it to the roof. The combination of my stealth and Steel Hoo's massive firepower keeping us alive, but it was getting harder. They were all alert for us now, and seemed to be considering their defenses. We had to run any time they got their spells up, and we were not fast enough to take out more than two before the others were able to cast their shields. Once on the, on the roof there were four more alicorns. They were sitting, frozen, at the four corners of the building. Their attentions focused inwards. Instead of surrounding themselves with a sphere of magical energy, they were cooperating, maintaining the hemisphere of magical force that was keeping the three griffin mercs caged. New one on me, Stulus muttered from beside me. Oh, thank the great egg, one of them blurted out, 
seeing us through the glowing shell of force that trapped her and the other two surviving griffins. She stopped. Where are the rest of you? I looked around. Velvet Remedy and Steel Hooves were flanking me. The goddesses knew where Calamity was. I suspected he was circling the Celestia line, hoping to spot us. I went at the thought and hoped he wasn't too worried. I could see the faintest suggestion of approach dawning on the skyline. A chilling wind blew at my mane, bringing the salty smell of the harbor. It was almost a shame that we had reached the roof in the dark of night. The view in the daytime must be amazing. Then again, the view could also paralyze me with vertigo. So, probably better we were here now, after all. Turning back to the three griffins, this is it. Just us. Well, this isn't much of a rescue, one of the griffins said bitterly. Gratitude. Look it up. I turned away and looked over the alicorns. They were statuesque in their concentration. I wasn't even sure they realized we were on the roof with them. And they were outside the shield that they were creating. We could take three of them down in a coordinated attack. And surely the griffins could take at least one. What kind of firepower do you guys still have? I could hear Stillhoof's whistle as the griffins in the back stepped forward. She was wearing what looked like a magically powered armor of her own, a griffin design, nowhere near as complicated or encompassing as seal hooves, leaving her talons, legs, and wings bare, as well as most of her face. With a large, tri-barreled, biggest battle saddle I've ever seen. Dismounted AA cannon, seal hooves said appraisingly. I had no idea what that meant, but this looked like the non-magical energy version of the plasma cannon that Calamity had used against the dragon. Well, we definitely had the firepower. Only five shots left, the griffin said glumly. Still, five shots from that thing is more than... And there are four wings to these horny bastards on their way. The first griffin announced. From her voice, I finally identified her as a Blackwing, as her Blackwing. I noted mentally that I would not have chosen the word horny to describe the Alicorns, unless Blackwing knew something I did not. Four wings? I asked. You mean two more? No, Sulu's interjected. She means twelve. Oh, well... Moon rocks. Made sense. A wing, then, must be a group of three. Explains why there were three of them hunting steel hooves outside Fenlock. These four have just been keeping us pinned here while the reinforcements arrive, Blackwing informed us. Wait. I perked up. We're okay, then. I'm pretty sure we took them out on our way up. I mentally counted. One in the pool, two at the safe, Three in the pit. One of those had lived, and joined up with the three more. So we'd killed... Nine. There were still three left. Somehow, we'd managed to go right past the whole wing of alicorns, either without partially realizing it. <clears throat> and they would probably be bursting into the roof any moment. We had to work fast. I quickly laid out the plan, and made everyone. And everyone started taking their positions. As they did so, I couldn't help but voice my suspicions to Blackwing. What is it that you mercenaries were after in this place that the creatures want so badly? Codes to crack the safe in the Ministry of Image on Ministry Walk. Blackwing said, surprisingly forthcoming. The safe contains an artifact that our employer would really like to possess. It turns out. The goddesses, I mean the goddess these masters serve, wanted too. What kind of artifact? I asked as I levitated out little Macintosh and checked the load. I was going to have to use magic bullets for this, 
just to be sure. The Black Book. Well, the Black Book of something or other. The tome of some of the foulest zebra magics. Stuff that can tear a pony's soul apart, they say. Or raise spirits from the grave. Necromancy. The very thought of such a spell and powers actually existed gave me nightmarish chills. To my knowledge, no pony had ever used such dark arts. It was horrifying to imagine that the zebras actually could. Necromancy wasn't even supposed to be real, just a horror story to scare young fillies at summer parties. If this was the sort of foulness the Ministry of Image was casting their nets to catch, the purging of books took on a whole new and terrifying light. I began to wonder if the purpose behind the confiscation of ideologically incompatible books wasn't, at least in part, a smokescreen for this. Because, by the goddesses, you couldn't tell the public that the zebras had necromancy. Much less that books on this stuff were slipping into Equestria. The notion of zebra necromancy breathed an uncomfortable new dimension into how being on the fringe of a megaspell event turned ponies into, a ghoul, into ghoul ponies and zombie ponies. While I was talking to Blackwing and pondering the implications of the Black Book, Steel Hooves and Velvet Remedy were discussing our foes. I caught the end of the conversation. Don't all have the same spells. Only the deep purple coated ones, like the wings below, can teleport, Stuhoves explained. The nightmare blue coats. Invisibility. Velvet Remedy interjected. Oh yes, I remember. The dark green ones? I haven't seen them do anything the others can't do. Steel Hooves walked up close to one of the statue-like alicorns, and took a close look at his cloak. A forest green so deep it was nearly black. Until now. Butcher, the griffin with the heavy gun, stood at the ready in front of the furthest alicorn. Steel Hooves had locked onto one on my left. Bald Remedy had her, formerly my, combat shotgun hovering an inch from the temple on the one on my right. I float a little Macintosh between the eyes of the one in front of me. On the count of three. One. Two. In a thunderous clash of gunshots and explosions, three alicorns went down. So did the shield. The last alicorn immediately sprang to life, alert, and the griffin's supergun let out a boom that could be heard on the moon. The fourth alicorn was simply no more. Blackwing swooped forward and took me in his talons, as the other lightly encumbered griffins scooped up velvet, taking off into the air. I threw a telekinetic stealth around Steel Hooves, carrying him with us. The last griffin took off, circling to cover our tail. We were a few blocks away when the last three alicorns burst into the roof. Part of me wanted to laugh tauntingly. Then. They reminded us that they could fly too. And unencumbered, they were much faster and more maneuverable. Rubbing themselves in magical shields, they swooped close and closed the distance. I closed my eyes, trying to force my PTM enhanced brain to think of something. For the first time, party time mintels were failing me. Well, now, y'all look like you could use some help. Only once before had I ever been so happy to hear Calamity's voice, and that was when I was facing a dragon. I opened my eyes, staring to him thankfully. I hope you have a plan, cause I've got nothing. Y'all just follow me, Calamity smiled, and shot out ahead of us, dropping altitude. Turns out, the one direction that heavily laden griffins could fly even faster than alicorns was down. They gave chase but we were pulling ahead. Unless you're driving, diving for a mattress factory, Blackwing scoffed, squawked. This will be a really short trip. I glanced back. There was good distance between us and the three creatures, now only visible by glowing bubbles of sickly green energy that zipped out through the sky towards us. Start pulling up now, Calamity called back. Does he have any idea? The griffin carrying Velvet Remedy grunted. 
how hard it is to pull up at this speed, carrying this much weight. I could see the streets coming up fast as we began to level. I smiled. Think of just how much junk Calamity had the habit of scavenging. I had no doubt that the answer was yes. The three griffins finally pulled straight up, <clears throat> with only yards to spare, skimming over the tops of the taller wagons. I felt a hoof drag along the top of a passenger wagon, and the alicorns were beginning to close the gap. Lightning ripped from one of their horns, shooting past us. Up ahead, the street ended in a massive parking lot. Rows upon rows of delivery wagons were lined up in a long building. With the exceptional visual clarity provided by Sparta Mentals, <clears throat> I was able to make out the logo on the roof of a building as we approached it. A filled-in black omega symbol with a white earth pony seeming to levitate a package on her back. I suddenly realized the plan. An eye blink before Calamity started shooting. I turned my EFS, making a quick scan for life down there. I only had a moment, but at least I had party time mentals boosting my keenness and judgment. All I was seeing were red blips scurrying around, below, probably rad roaches. I could hear a series of pops as we shot past the delivery wagon and over the rooftops. The alicorns were reaching the parking lot, moving too fast to stop, when the first delivery wagons exploded like mega spell bombs, an extreme miniature. The first explosions instantly set off the rest. The three city blocks erupted into a vibrant cascade of insanely colored light. Their shields couldn't protect them against that. The blast of radiation couldn't heal them from the force that ripped them apart beneath a cellular level. They could not even mentally scream. There was no time. The three alicorns were simply gone. The building shielded us, just enough of us, to save us from being vaporized. My pipbox screamed as we were hit by a wave of heat and radiation. My EFS flashed a red warning that I was suffering radiation poisoning before it collapsed together. My pipbox crashing. A moment later, we crashed too. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Mighty Telekinesis, level 3. Your telekinesis is Twilight Sparkle tier. You can now handle multiple objects with ease. And with enough focus, you'd probably carry around Inner Major. <laughs>